Centre for Apologetics. And it is a centre that started about seven years ago, although really took off, maybe about three or four, um, to specifically engage Muslims, Muslim missionaries in Britain, um, who have a huge influence on Muslims around the world. And we also, um, we engage with Muslims face to face, the Muslim missionaries uh, or Muslim refugees to the country. And we travel around Britain and parts of the world training the church to confidently respond to Islam. And we have a movement in England that tends to, in general, tends to try find common ground with Islam and come alongside Islam. What we want to train the church to do is actually confidently engage the ideas of Islam possibly love your Muslim friend or absolutely love your Muslim friend, but engage the ideas of Islam. So it's just training the church to confidently understand it and also debate Muslims um, and critique the actual religion itself. Sarah, why don't you tell us a little bit about your authority, the two of you, what, what, what's your authority to address a subject like this? Well, um, Beth has an MA in Islamics, um, so she's studied up, she's been working with Muslims, living with Muslims for many years. She lived in Istanbul and also works with a lot of refugees throughout her life as well. And of course, engaging debates, you've done public debates which are online. And then myself, I've grown and lived in London, always had Muslim friends, always had Muslim neighbours and have been engaging for about the last 10 years. Um, in the last four years, I've been doing it a bit more formally with Fanda. But just really um, interested in getting to the nitty gritty of Islam and, and where it clashes with Christianity. I um, got interested in it as soon as I found out that the Quran talks about Jesus, it perked up my interest. And <laughs> since then, um, we have been really trying to help Muslims understand where the Quran gets it wrong and why they shouldn't trust in it. You were just in Africa. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I was in Africa. I was invited to speak at the University of the Gambia. And the Gambia is a very, very small country, just it's basically a river. And what the British did, they sailed down the river and they shot cannonballs out on either side. And wherever the cannonballs landed, they said that was going to be their ground. So that's how the, the country of uh, the Gambia was formed. It's, just, it's, a, it's a really strange shape, but it's 90% Muslim and about 2% Christian. And so when I was going into the university, I was going in to speak with a class that is majority Muslim. Um, and when I got to the Gambia, uh, I was quite intrigued because it was very, very peaceful. You, wherever you would go, you say, well, the Muslims and Christians, we, we love each other, we're tolerant, anyone's free to practice their religion. And I was thinking, well, how can this be? Because they're, they're so opposed. But I realized the Christians there, although they were on, you know, wanting to preach the gospel, they, was, they would say to me, um, you know, maybe don't say Muhammad, say Prophet Muhammad. Or they'd say, um, you know, don't say Islamic slavery, say, just say um, Arab slavery. So there was always this little bit of, <laughs> little bit of um, submission to Islam. And I only needed to scratch the surface. I did, um, we went to a school and we did a talk and I just had to say that, you know, we believe Jesus is God. And then I saw people stand up and say, how can you say this? So everything was just underneath the surface. Um, so while I was there, I did a talk on slavery and colorism and how the, the Arab slave trade was an antecedent to the transatlantic and the issues of colorism, which were pretty much started in the seventh century. There was an initial colorism before that we see in history. So there was, I mean, I could expand on that, but it would take like two hours. <laughs> but um, but that, that was my experience in the Gambia. And the, the notion that Islam is peaceful out there is just only peaceful if you don't touch it. Just be careful not to touch it, then you'll be fine. Um, Beth, why don't you tell us a little bit about your um, uh, authority in addressing an issue like this? I've been working with Muslims about 24 years or so, and I actually um, found, got a real burden for Muslims here in America. I did my Bible college at a small college up in Iowa, right on the Mississippi River. And it was there I went to visit a mosque. In fact, it was the first mosque built in America. And it was Muslim missionaries in the Midwest who were taking Islam to the Midwest. And I remember taking a three hour tour around the mosque with the Imam. And we were asking him all sorts of questions about Islam. He was pleasant, he was polite. He um, uh, told us a very romanticized view of Islam, almost Christian in the way he was communicating the religion, which is what we find they do both here and also back in the United Kingdom. 
Um, at the very end of this three-hour tour, I said to him, and I was just a 20-year-old, and I said to him, uh, what is your view of Satan? I'm not entirely sure why I asked that question, but I just said, what is your view of Satan? And immediately up to then, he'd been pleasant, he'd been charming, he'd been um, composed. Suddenly, the absolute fear filled his eyes and he started looking around him and he turned to us and he said I don't talk about that I don't talk about that and within a few minutes we were ushered outside of the mosque and I remember thinking as a 20 year old I thought this religion Islam this is a Muslim missionary to America and this Muslim missionary has no power over the evil one and I as a 20 year old had no fear to ask him a question about the evil one because I knew we had the power over the evil one and that really began my journey into working with Muslims I worked with Muslims at Bible College um, not actually at the Bible College but when I was at the Bible College here then I moved back to um, the United Kingdom and um, I started working with Muslim refugees. I was working in a small little church plant in London. These were, these were very pastoral situations. We had many women who had been raped and abused, so you can imagine the sort of um, uh, counseling we were doing with these women. And the church was really growing. They were really turning to Christ. But I began to see there were many traditional Orthodox Muslims walking down the streets of London, long flowing robes, big long beards, women in their full niqab, which is um, the black robes with just the slits, or just um, hijab, which is just the scarf. And I remember praying and asking the Lord, how do I reach this kind of Muslim? How do I, I get through the barrier that they so clearly put up? And that was when I found out about, out, out about a ministry um, at a place called Speaker's Corner in London, where Muslim missionaries go to share their faith. And we find Muslim missionaries share their faith across the country um, with book tables, with open um, day, um, days at their mosques. And we started going to where the Muslim missionaries were and began to engage with the Muslim missionaries. Missionaries. And we've had debates, probably for the last 20 years of my life, I've debated a Muslim every single week of my life. Um, so it's been a lot of fun, a quick learning curve. Um, and you learn to um, communicate your faith quickly and concisely. And you learn the latest arguments that Muslims are putting against the Christian faith. Um, and you learn to really defend your faith, sometimes in a fairly hostile situation. Beth, um, do you find that you have any success this way? Are you, are, are you seeing conversions through this? Absolutely. We are seeing conversions, not just in the United Kingdom, but in parts of Asia, and where this approach to Islam, and unfortunately, it's fairly new in the, in the last sort of 100 years or so. We have found in missions to Muslims, the way missionaries have been taking the gospel to Muslims has tended to be just through, you might have heard the term friendship evangelism. Friendship evangelism is a strange idea to me. I never came across it until I went to the United Kingdom. And it's the idea that you come alongside a Muslim, you build a friendship, and then slowly introduce them to the gospel, or maybe some don't even seem to do that. And as founder, we, we want to take it a step further. We don't just, we want to make friends with Muslims, but it's so much more than that. We love our Muslim friends so much, we want them to hear the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the real problems of the Quran and of the life of Muhammad. So we're finding as we are talking with Muslims this way, um, as we are training the church to confidently talk with Muslims this way, we're giving them the, the ideas of how to communicate the faith and how to challenge Islam. We're finding more and more Muslims are beginning to doubt their religion. Now my team leader, Jay Smith, who Sarah and I work with, he um, went to India a couple of years ago. And the Indian brothers and sisters are light years ahead of us in the West when it comes to confidently engaging Islam. And when he was in India, um, he, he, went to, he heard about a debate where 300 Muslims, some of whom were radical Muslims, became Christians at this one debate. And he said, how, how did that happen? And the Indian brothers and sisters said this, in Islam, when you ask a probing question that causes a Muslim to doubt or to rethink that through their faith, they have no relationship to, of, to, with God to fall back on. So when the, so a seed of doubt falls into them, they don't have a relationship with God, they don't know where to turn to, um, they don't have any foundation, and that seed of doubt begins to completely dismantle their faith. 
And as a result, they begin to leave Islam, and then if Christians are there with a good, clear gospel message, lead them into Christ. With Christianity, I have my faith attacked every single week of my life, either by atheists or by Muslims. But I have a relationship with God, and more than that, we have the answers where Christianity has all, many, many answers to the difficult questions of life, Islam has none. But you see, for hundreds of years, Islam has not been held accountable. Muslims have not been questioned by Christians. And that is why we're trying to bring this into the church. So Christians will begin to question Muslims, and in that way, many will come to Christ. And they are now beginning to come through. Sarah, tell us a little bit about Speaker's Corner. Now, the, the idea of what Speaker's Corner is is so bizarre to Americans. So why don't, why don't you explain to us a little bit about the, the, the place itself and then what goes on there? Yeah, Speaker's Corner is a lovely little place in London. Well, I shouldn't say little. It's little compared to America, but it's a big park in London. And at a corner of the park, there's a place where people gather every Sunday and they just speak. It could be on anything. It used to be on politics. And the reason why it was called Speaker's Corner before, it was, it was the place where if people were getting hanged, um, it was a place of execution, they would be able to speak and say their last speech before, they were, <laughs> before they, were, they were hanged. But it came to be a place of free speech. You just say anything you like. But in recent years, it's been a place where Muslims and Christians have debated. You'll find atheists down there. You'll find black Israelites, Israelites down there. Sometimes you'll find um, some Jews down there. But it's mainly Christians and Muslims. And I would say the majority is, is Muslims. So you go along there. You can take a little ladder. You can go up and speak on anything. And crowds will gather. Or you can just have conversations in the crowds, which um, many of us um, prefer to do. But what, what it really does is it's a public bulwark. It's a public defense of Christianity and it's a public proclamation of why we think Islam is wrong, why we think the Quran is wrong, why we think Muhammad should not be the example for all mankind. And we found um, Christians coming from Islamic countries like Lebanon and Libya and Saudi Arabia and they are crying because they have never seen Islam challenged publicly. They've, they've had to kowtow to Islam everywhere they go. And here is a place where we have freedom of speech. We don't have guns in the UK, or not many. So, <laughs> so you're, pretty, you're pretty safe in saying what, what you want to say. So it's a very important place where we can just speak and we can challenge. What we do down there as well is we take some of the latest scholarship. So there's um, experts looking into the Quran. As Beth has said, Islam hasn't been challenged. We know in the 18th and 19th century, the Bible came under some really heavy criticism from some of the German schools, some historic critique, literary critique, and all kinds of critique. And Islam hasn't had that. So scholars are doing that now. They're looking at the Quran, saying, actually, where did your stories come from? You're saying that it's never changed. Why are we looking at the manuscripts? Why does there seem to be changes between your manuscripts? How comes your earliest manuscripts two don't agree? And in fact, if we follow your Islamic history, how comes we don't see the same timeline in history as we do in your Islamic stories? So these are the kind of critique that we bring to Muslims and we're asking for their response. And we receive their response and we do our more research and we're saying, actually, no, that's not true because A, B, C. And so we have this conversation. It's a place where we test out um, scholarship, but it's also a place where we just hold Islam accountable. And it needs to be done because it's not being done um, anywhere else. It seems our, gov our politicians cannot do it. Um, um, other religions um, probably don't understand it, but we understand it because we rely on one thing. We rely on our book. This is what we read, the Bible and we see the example through Jesus Christ. They rely on a book, the Quran. They see the example through Muhammad. So we understand each other very, very well. And so we criticize the book. As Beth says, if the book is criticized and it has no foundation, then what do they have left? Why don't you tell us, Beth, just a little bit about, that? we should back up just a bit. Tell us a little bit about the context in which you're in. What's going on in Britain? What's going on in London? What's going on in Europe regarding Islam? Well, probably very similar to America in the sense of a staunch secularism and atheism is permeating the continent. 
And when you have a staunch secularism and a staunch atheism uh, permeating your society and where Christian values and family values are being dismantled, that has all through history always allowed or created a vacuum, especially a religious vacuum, and the religion that loves to fill it tends to be Islam. And that is what is happening in Britain. And because at the, at the top of our society, our government and so on, and even high up in some of the, for example, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, there is um, a real movement of, unfortunately, um, Anglicans and priests who uh, are, uh, start from the premise that Islam and Christianity is the same God um, or the same religion. Allah and Yahweh are the same God. Islam and Christianity are part of the Abrahamic faith. How many of you have heard it described that way? And if you start from that premise, if that's your starting point, you will immediately begin to compromise. And there are many people in the church that have done this. And I would suggest that maybe about 50% of missionaries to Britain and 50% of those high up in the church who have some authority in the land believe that Allah and Yahweh are the same God and that Islam is part of the Abrahamic tradition. So immediately you have a compromise in place. And that is why many, many Christians around the world, and some of that movement, by the way, starts here in America um, from uh, Bible colleges like Fuller Seminary, where an idea of trying to find common ground with Islam um, is the approach. So they're, they're not trying to find common ground with the people of Islam, the Muslims, where you can relate to them as a human being. They're trying to find common ground with the religion itself, with the ideology. And so you have that happening in the Christian realm. Then you have staunch secularism. And staunch secularism is desperate to uh, describe Islam as a peaceful religion. How many of you have heard that? Uh, they're desperate to describe Islam almost through the grid of Christianity. So it's like Christianity. Um, they're desperate to describe the radical Muslims, of which um, Sarah and I engage with often on a weekly basis, that radical Islam has nothing to do with um, Islam itself. It is just 1% of the whole Muslim population is a statistic I've heard uh, bandied around. And they try to say it's just those crazies over there. It's not legitimate Muslims. And this is is what our politicians are saying. And so there's a lot of confusion, both among secularists, um, even among Christians who sign up to that. Uh, for example, I was talking to a very influential Christian um, from Belgium who actually believes that radical Islam is only 1% of the whole Islamic population and that they're just crazies, that was his description, and that moderate Islam is really the true version of Islam, an assimilated, westernized version of the religion. And so there's a lot of confusion out there and misinformation. And so we as Fanda are, are moving into um, the secular realm and the Christian realm to try bring about some understanding and clarity about this religion. And that if we continue to allow our family values in Europe and in America to be dismantled, there is a religion waiting on the sidelines to fill its place. And that is one of the reasons why a lot of Westerners are now being attracted to Islam. Because they see some strength in this religion. They see some backbone in Islam. They see something that Christianity should be offering. In its truest form, we offer the backbone. We offer the strength and the conviction. But unfortunately, in Europe, that's not really the kind of Christianity that we have. And so we're in a very confused situation in the United Kingdom, and I find that here in America as well. In fact, last year, I was speaking at a Bible school here in America, and a young man came up and he said to me, in fact, he blurted out in the middle of class, that's not what my Muslim friends say. My Muslim friends say Islam is peaceful. They wouldn't hurt anyone. And I said to the young man, ah, so you're judging a whole religion by your friend. Your friend is lovely, absolutely. Some of my best friends in London are Muslims. I spend half my week in the homes of Muslims. They're beautiful people. It's not the people I have an issue with, it's the ide ideology I have an issue with. Larry talks about, he uses a phrase, if, and you will know this if you heard him speak, he says, ideas have consequences. Well, in Islam, the idea of Islam has consequences, and people are not taking its ideas and its ideology seriously, seriously enough. Um, 
Uh, how do people react um, to your approach? You know, you talk about friendship evangelism and so forth. I, is you know, not, all, not, not all British Christians are in favor of, of this kind of approach that you're talking about. Tell us a little bit about the state of Christianity in Britain and then tell us on the back end of that how people react to the way you go about evangelizing and defending the Christian faith. Go ahead. I mean, we've had Christians shouting at us saying, this is not love. <laughs> We're thinking you're not loving us right now. Um, there's, a <laughs> there's a confusion between um, um, loving, loving the Muslim and not saying anything negative to hurt their feelings. And in fact, it's, it seems to be an Islamic concept that, or a, a concept that I find in Islamic countries where you don't talk about things that hurt another person. You just don't talk about it. Um, and, so, and so when people, um, if, if I can give the example of Charlie Hebdo, the Charlie Hebdo case, where the people wrote cartoons and drew cartoons about Muhammad. They also drew cartoons about the Pope and the Trinity and all kinds of things, but that, that didn't raise the reaction. It was the cartoons about Muhammad that raised the reaction. And we had Christians saying, well, you can't offend them. You've, you've offended them, you've caused these riots. And this is the state of the church, when even the Bishop of London is, is siding with the Muslims, saying, don't critique it because you're hurting their feelings. And, and it's, it's a confusion as to what Islam actually is, how it is fundamentally against Jesus Christ, every fundamental thing about Christianity, the death of Jesus Christ, the, the, um, the divinity of Jesus, the sonship of Jesus, Islam denies it all. Yet the bishop, the archbishop of England can defend Islam. So this is, this is the context that we're operating in. And he is not alone. As Beth has said, 50% of the missionaries and many, many Christians would agree with him that um, Islam is just still Muslims are just understood. They're serving the same God. Maybe they're a little misguided. Um, you know, they don't know what they're doing. We have to come alongside and, and, and maybe even we should pray with them. Maybe we should pray the Fatiha, which is the first chapter of the Quran which also talks about don't be like the Christians who are led astray. Um, they're saying we should pray that. We even had the absurd situation. A church, was it in Scotland? Churches, St. Mary's in Glasgow. St. Mary's in Glasgow, where um, they invited a, a Muslim girl to come up during the liturgy and, and pray and, and recite Islamic verse, which explicitly denies the sonship and the divinity of Christ. I mean, it's in a poor state. I'm sure you can see that. I'm sure you can see that. And in terms of our own ministry, as I said, people have told us that we're not loving. Um, we've been um, shunned from some Christian conferences because our approach is too, too um, confrontational. Um, and yet they forget that Jesus sometimes was confrontational. The Apostle Paul was sometimes confrontational. Really, the, the issue is, do we want to tell Muslims about the gospel or are we happy to pat them on the back on their way to a lost eternity? And so this is the battle that we're fighting, not just with the secularists, not just with the Muslims, but in many cases with our own brethren. But there is a hope. Uh, we are beginning to see the tide turning. We're beginning to see the British church and even the European church um, come on side. And the reason for that is because so many Christians are being um, disillusioned by the good arguments that Muslims are posing against our faith. Our young people are converting to Islam. Christian kids are converting to Islam. Christian girls are marrying Muslim men. And so the church is waking up that there is a big issue here, realizing, ooh, this is not really the same. And we're finding many more Christians are beginning now to come on side, partly because Muslims are so proactive in their mission in Britain, so proactive in bringing Christianity down and placing it with Islam, that the church now has to um, get ready to engage. And it's not enough just to make a friend, they're realizing they have to come up with the answers. So we're seeing a real move now. Yeah. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, um, I mean, even in our population statistics, we're seeing the 0 to 5 year olds, 50% um, times um, more Muslim children born or Muslim children between the age of 0 to 5 than the rest of the general population. And it led to even a boy in my Sunday school class questioning me when I said Jesus is God. And I start to probe further, and all of his friends at school are Muslim. And so this is what he's hearing. 
um, you know, when he's speaking with his friends, this is his peer group, this is who he interacts with every single day. And then at the same time, we have madrasas. We have children going to school, maybe two hours every day, Muslim children, and on the weekend, learning about Islamic theology. So in, in the UK, we have 2,000 madrasas, and it caters for about a quarter of a million Muslim children. Every single day, they're learning about their religion, and their religion denies Christ. And so they're coming back and they're asking our Christian kids all these good, good questions. You know, how can Jesus be the son of God? How can God become a man? And all these kind of questions that you know, our children need to know. But oftentimes, we're still, they're still coloring in Noah's Ark <laughs> and things like that. They're not ready. So this is another challenge that we're posing. And we've started up a, we're starting up a youth syllabus, a youth course to help, to help the Christian kids engage on that, in that level. Why don't you tell us a little bit, you, you touched on um, uh, women's issues for, for just a moment. Um, why don't you tell us about what happened in Rotherham? Yes, uh, again, this is staunch secularism that isn't really understanding what Islam is all about or is afraid to challenge the Muslim community. And I don't know if you heard of the terrible um, abuse cases we happened across the country. It's um, now known as the Rotherham um, problem, but, but it actually is across the country, and this is a town in Northern England, where there were Muslim gangs of young, very handsome Arab and Asian, mostly Asian men, um, preying on young white girls um, mostly, who were really girls who come from poor families, who often were found playing on the streets, and they were wooing these girls with alcohol and drugs, and then bringing them in, basically trafficking them and bringing and abusing them in Muslim sex gangs. Now, our media described them as Asian sex gangs, but they were almost 99% Muslim sex gangs. And for years, the police did nothing about it. And the reason for it is because if they did, they would have been called Islamophobic, which is in England one of the worst sins that you can be called. And because they're so afraid, because society is so afraid, and Christians are afraid to be called Islamophobic, and because they're afraid to be taken to court, and etc., this abuse was happening across the country with our young girls across the country. Um, there's cases where we know there's been honor killings. There's cases where we know I, we have a, a friend who was raped by her father, who was an imam from the time she was six years old to the time she was 16. And again, this, the secular child services found out there was a problem in the home. And as they interviewed the young lass when she was 16, they brought in a Pakistani interpreter or a Pakistani social worker. And in Urdu, the Pakistani social worker turned to the girl who'd been sexually abused by her father for all those years and said to her, why are you shaming our religion? Why are you shaming our culture? And this was a social worker that worked for the British social services, the child services. Thankfully, uh, even though and he sent her back into the home, but thankfully she sought help again, and she was then placed with a Christian family, and she became a Christian. And now she married a wonderful Christian man, and they're serving the Lord together to take the gospel back to Muslims. But this is the sort of scenario that's happening through our culture over and over and over again. It is the secular realm that doesn't know what to do with Islam. And it's uniquely Christians that have the antidote, the answer, and the courage and the confidence to be able to start to say the hard things of what this religion is all about. I, I want to add a little something to this. I happen to know um, one of the journalists at the Times of London, and it was the Times of London that uncovered this scandal at Rotherham. And just as, as Beth has indicated, um, this had been going on for a decade, and um, dozens of girls had reported it, and no action was taken up by the police for the reasons that this Beth has just, just given. Finally, due to the courage of a real journalist, and there, there are very few of them anymore, trust me, um, who did some, uh, some real investigative work, exposed this. But the Times said, don't say it's, it's Muslims. Change it to Asians. And so it was reported as Asians were, were raping these girls. Turns out there were 1,400 girls who had been trafficked. And the way this, 
this, uh, this looked was that, you know, they would get, you know, they would romance these girls as she's indicated and then uh, maybe get them drunk or drugged and then um, record them having sex and then threaten to send that somewhere or post it and then tell these girls that they would continue doing this and they would begin making loads of money off of these girls and um, threaten them. And in a couple of instances, girls who said they, they wanted it to stop or that they were going to tell someone, they took them out into the countryside, dumped gasoline on them and held a, a lighter and said, now, do you understand what will happen to you if you report this? I mean, this is the kind of thing that was going on. And the, the, the British governmental system failed them massively. Well, as I say, it was reported that Asians were doing these things. And fortunately, many Asians, um, Sikhs, um, a Chinese, Koreans said, whoa, 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 whoa. This wasn't Asians. Let's be clear who's doing this. These were Muslims. And they were, I think, uh, um, Afghans with maybe a couple of Pakistanis. Pakistani mainly. OK, in reverse there. So, uh, but all Muslims. And this was being done all over the country. And you see, you're in this, this is due to, and I'm going to ask Sarah now to expand a little bit, or rather, pardon me, if I may go back to Beth, since it's her expertise. Tell us a little bit about the Muslim view of women, the Islamic view of women. One of the ways that many, uh, many, Islam is growing in the West is through women. Uh, unfortunately, there is a wonderful romanticized story of Muhammad as a wonderful husband, as a wonderful father, as someone who is good for women. Islam is good for women. It gives um, freedom to women. It makes women and man equal. And you hear these stories and the kind of material that they're putting out at their book tables and their mosques, and many women are falling for it. it tends to be nominal Christian women or those who have no faith at all, but it can also I've known evangelical girls, and maybe not biblically literate evangelical girls, but girls in the evangelical churches also falling for this. In the United Kingdom, we also have a situation in the church where we have about three to or four women to one Christian man. Um, there's a, a real uh, absence of men in our church in the United Kingdom, which means many Christian girls will not find husbands. And so there's all sorts of hot issues um, happening here, and they are falling for um, Muslim men. Now, I did my MA in, um, in gender in Islam. And one of the things you will hear is that Islam uh, treats women and mothers with respect. But as you read through the Quran, you'll see two things that are very prominent in the Quran and also in the life of Muhammad. So the book, um, we always talk about and founded the book and the man. To judge a religion, you go to the book and the man. For Muslims, that is the Quran, Muhammad. For Christians, that is Jesus, um, the, the Bible and the Lord Jesus. Well, when you go to the Book and the Man of Islam, you find, in, for example, in chapter 4, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 24, chapter 4, verse 34, you will see verses on how women are to be treated. In chapter 4, verse 3, it says that you must treat all your four wives equally, except, and has a get-out clause, the woman that you own. It is translated as that which your right hand possesses, the woman that you own. Then in Surah 4.24, you cannot marry women already married except the women that you own. So if Islam came in into power here in Birmingham, Alabama, you will, and Muslims came into the building, there was not one married woman that would be safe here because you would become the sex slave um, of, of that particular Muslim. Beth, let me interrupt for one second. Tell us about the exchange that you mentioned um, last night, I believe it was. Um, we, I, maybe Sarah knows what I'm referring to. The comment that a Muslim made to yes. a um, to a priest regarding what you're just talking about. Oh, okay. That was um, the comment that I made. Is um, there was a pastor who I know who engages with this imam um, very regularly, and um, they were talking about these verses, um, Surah 43, 424, about those who right hand possesses, and they were asking about, well, you know, what exactly does this mean? If Sharia was to come to the UK, um, you know, are you saying that you would, you would take my wife? And he said, yes, <laughs> I would rape your wife. And he said it like deadpan. And he was like, oh, you're joking, aren't you? <laughs> there was no response. Um, but Beth has had a similar situation at Speaker's Corner. 
So, yes, so um, I once went down to Speaker's Corner and I took down the biography of Muhammad, which shows him taking women who are married, killing the husbands, and then taking the women for himself, always the most beautiful women. And I was opening up one of these stories and showing the Muslim crowd, and they swamped around me, and some Muslim missionaries started to take me on. And for 20 minutes, I just kept holding up the, the biography of Muhammad and saying, it's right here, Muhammad killed this woman's husband and then took her as his wife and consummated it almost straight away. And fascinating, one of the main Muslim missionaries and Larry had a big debate with him, you actually can find it online. He came and he was walking, uh, he was walking uh, past and he shouted out, oh Beth, you're just scared what we're going to do to you when we come to power. And it was fascinating because this man would not normally say that, but because we were so proving what Islam does to women. And take note, folks, this is exactly what ISIS has done to women. So when people say that ISIS or radical Muslims are crazies and have nothing to do with Islam, actually it's right through their texts. ISIS took Christian and Yazidi women and they took married women and little girls and they were sex slaves to Islam. That is right through the Quran in many different verses. It is also right through Islamic law. In fact, Islamic law says that a Muslim man can take Christian women as their wives and they can kill the husbands to do so. And, they can, and, and they, if they don't convert to Islam, sometimes those women just stay as sex slaves or as conquerors which is a sex slave. And so it's right through um, the whole teaching of Islam. It is through the history of Islam. Islam has always done this to woman and has always done this to man, where their wives can be taken and the man can be killed. It's the history, it's the theology, and it's the politics of Islam, according to the Quran, the text, and the life of Muhammad. I happen to be, pardon me for one second, Sarah, I happen to be with Sarah and, and Beth, but I was next to Sarah, if you don't mind me telling the story, um, at um, Speaker's Corner in January, I believe it was. And um, so I'm standing on the ladder debating with uh, these sorts or arguing with them. And, uh, um, and then there were some real specific kind of questions that were coming up regarding the Quran. So Beth, uh, rather Sarah came and um, began to engage with them. And one man, just as racist as he could be, um, came up but a Muslim and began shouting at her um, that she's a slave, a slave, Shout, shouting at her, pointing at her, and he kept, just kept saying it again and again and again, you're a slave, you're a slave, you're a slave. And I thought that she handled this so beautifully and uh, you know, she's such a gentle personality, but she said, well of course you would say that because that's your view of women. Um, meaning that, that's, that's what your holy book says. And it was just such a wonderful way of pointing out to the crowd, do you see do you see what this religion really is? Sarah? Yeah, um, and I was going to say, um, you will find many Muslim women who would say, of course that's not the case. Look at me, I'm, I'm working, I can go wherever I want, I can drive, I can choose my own destiny. And we say, that's great for you. But what we're doing is we're looking at the actual text. We're looking at the life of Muhammad, the way he interpreted this text. So I'm glad that you're living a nice free Western life, but give a thought for your sisters, you know, and back in some Islamic countries where they don't have that same freedom, that same privilege. Now, um, perhaps I'm asking this question um, belatedly, given the, the course the direction is taken, but is, uh, is Islam a religion of peace? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Don't you unpack our politicians that? say it is. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Very clearly. And why? You just go to the Book of the Man. You go to the life of Muhammad, which they call the Sirah Rasulullah. You don't need to worry about the, the Arabic term so much. Um, there's five genres of literature that a Muslim has to go to to know how to practice their faith. Um, and these are mostly your Sunni Muslims, which are the mainstream Islam. They'd be like, if you like, the Protestants of Islam, if you want to use a, a sort of a, an equivalent. And then you have your Shia Muslims. Um, they would be like your Catholics of Islam. Um, that's sort of the divide. And your Sunni Muslims, and of course your Shia Muslims, they will follow different genres of literature. Now, the majority of Muslims um, follow these five um, genres of literature to know how to live today. And none of those books are peaceful. So the first one is the Quran, the highest authority. Then you have the Sira Rasulullah, the Sira, which is the biography of Muhammad. Then you have the Hadith, which are the sayings of Muhammad. 
Then you have the tafsir, which is the interpretations of the Quran. Then you have the tariq, which is the history of Islam. And nothing about the history of Islam from its very inception, from its very beginning, all the way through to today, nothing about Islam is peaceful. In fact, it is a very modern day phenomena to, in, to begin describing Islam as peaceful. There's almost 150 verses in the Quran that um, to use violent jihad against the unbeliever. Uh, all through history, the exegetes, the tafsir, have always described jihad or Muslim engagement with non-Muslims in a violent way. Or if it's to be peaceful, so for example, we, ha we know a very well-known missionary in Britain, he is Pakistani, has huge influence across the Muslim world, including here in America. And he, he has done a study of, the, of, um, of Islamic Spain, they call it Andalusia. And in Islamic Spain, they talk about how um, Muslims moved into Spain and up to France, and how Muslims live uh, peacefully side by side, side, by side with non-Muslims. But they're not telling the full story. The full story is this. They went from Arabia right through North Africa, pillaged North Africa, enslaved the North Africans, then took those enslaved North Africans into Spain, up through um, to, to France. And they, they, uh, as they went through, they pillaged, they marauded, they took all the loot and the wealth for themselves. And they said, either you convert or you live as Zuma, which means you come under Islam, so you live under the authority of Islam and you pay a hefty fine. If you don't convert to Islam, you pay a hefty fine. And what they would do is as they went in, they, they, had, they, they moved forward with, with such, doing such terrible atrocities that people were terrified as they heard about the Muslim marauders moving through. And that's why they lived peacefully, because they were basically trying to survive. And so this idea that Islam is a religion of peace, it has never been in the history of Islam. It has never been in the life of Muhammad. In fact, one of the biographies of Muhammad, one of the most important biographies, is called Maghazi. Maghazi means raids or raider. Muhammad was a raider. He did raids. That is the name of the biography. So right from the very beginning, he is seen a man of raiding or a man who raided. And when you look at Islam, and most Muslims do not know their history, when you see how it moved from Arabia um, across Africa into Spain, across um, through to Constantinople, right through to India and China, it moved with the sword. It did not move with conversion. And I love to see and do a comparison between Muhammad and Jesus. If you look at Muhammad and his followers, they were uh, immediately destroying and conquering towns and cities. What about Jesus? Did his disciples conquer towns and cities? Within a hundred years, the gospel had reached um, to the other parts of the world, and the sword was not used once. For the first 400 years of Christianity, the sword was not used to spread the faith. With Islam, from the very beginning, the sword was used. This is not a peaceful religion. This is a violent religion to its core. Um, what about violence now? What's driving it? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I said the violence now. What do you think is driving the violence now? In other words, uh, we often hear today, right after 9-11, the, uh, the, the narrative was these people are crazy. These are all crazy. And, um, but the religion itself is people. Now, this was George Bush. This was a Barack Obama who insisted the religion is peaceful. It's just there are a few crazies. How do you respond to something like that? First of all, you can understand why our politicians and some of our um, high up Anglicans or priests and so on are desperate to try say that Islam is peaceful and that radical Islam and the attacks against us have nothing to do with the religion. Because if you admit that the terrorism that we experience is something to do with the religion, how on earth as a politician do you grapple with that? How on earth, as someone of no faith, if you're a secularist or atheist, grapple with that? You have absolutely no answer. Because 
because if it is a bunch of crazies or a bunch of misfits as they've been described in the United Kingdom, if that's what it is, then you as a politician can maybe find a solution. Maybe it's a political solution. So you can understand why our governments are desperate to describe um, Islam, uh, Muslims or Islam itself, the religion, as peaceful. But actually, they are completely ignoring history. They are completely ignoring the text of Islam itself. And they are completely ignoring the, the message of the terrorists themselves. The terrorists quote Islamic scripture after scripture. The Quran is quoted almost every time a terrorist makes a public statement. It's because they're supporting their actions by the Quran. Uh, we have, and we maybe shouldn't publicly admit this, but we have the Tablik manuals, which is ISIS manuals um, at our office. Because we research radical Islam, we need to know what they're saying. You can down, I don't encourage you to do this, but you can download them off the internet. I, I have them on my iPad if anyone wants to see them. <laughs> And you will see quote after quote after quote of Muhammad and the Quran supporting almost every action they do. And so they are sourcing everything in their texts, but our world is not listening to them. Our world can't cope with listening to them. It is only uniquely Christians, those who also follow a text, those who also follow a man, the God who took on flesh and dwelt among us, it is only us that can, one, respond rightly, to understand them. I am a radical Christian. Radical means root. I go back to my roots. I go back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I get radical Muslims. I completely disagree with them. But you see, I go back to my roots, to my man and to my book who tells me to love my enemy, to pray for those who persecute me. And Muslims go back to their man and their book who tells them to hurt their enemy, who tells them to kill their enemy and to not make friends with their enemy. And so we have two very different paradigms. And all we need to do is to challenge one paradigm and bring it to its knees, that is Islam, and replace it with the alternative, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Terrorism today has nothing to do with politics. Politics exacerbates it, yes. Politics can sometimes ignite a little bit of rage. But how many Christians around the world have been treated terribly? More so, I would say, than Muslims. Do you find Christian terrorists? Not at all. And yet, I would say we know, in fact, the statistics coming out um, in the media right now say that Christians are the most persecuted people group in the world. But none of us are terrorists because it's not in our theology. So why is it when Muslims feel disgruntled, which some of them do, they react as terrorists? Because it's in their theology. That's the root of modern day terrorism. It's also a means of attaining heaven, isn't it? Yes, there is, it's the only way you can guarantee you're going to get into paradise. And as a man, you're going to get lots of virgins. It's the only way that you will enter the afterlife. If you, if you die while you're fighting jihad, if you don't die, then you're not, co you're not guaranteed, but you have to die while fighting jihad. This is why suicide missions are so um, attractive to some. It's, it's not an act of insanity, it's an act of desperation. It's an act of, of, a, of a religious person who will, knows they will never be saved who knows they're never going to be with God, because in Islamic theology, even when you die and you go into the Islamic paradise, Allah is not there. Allah is not in the Islamic paradise. In fact, it is just a very sexual, very sinful paradise for men. That's all that's there, and a lovely garden. Um, so Muslims have a religion that requires them to do these rituals and are absolute acts of obedience to Allah without question. And when they do die, they will maybe will enter paradise. Most Muslims believe they're going to go to hell. Some will work off their sins in hell, which is a, a terrible place, and they'll work themselves out of hell into the paradise. But, and women. And uh, women, yes, but less women. Muhammad looked into hellfire, and he saw that 80% of the people in hellfire were women. And the women said, oh, Muhammad, why is this the case? This is in the sayings of Muhammad in the Hadith. And Muhammad said, because women were ungrateful to their husbands. And that's why the majority of people in hell are women. The other reason was, um, he said, because women are deficient in their intelligence. And um, they are deficient um, in the <laughs> because in, in the Quran, it says that when you go into a court of law, 
You have to have two women um, to, to take the place of one man but in case one woman uh, forgets and, and errs. And so you need two women to remind each other in case they make a mistake. Um, and then Muhammad said it's because they're deficient in their intelligence. And this is why they're in hell. And you can see why this is a man-made religion. I mean, this is a, this is a religion that plays on, on all of the predatory and evil desires of men. You, you, you have violence, um, sexual conquest, all of that is built into uh, to the religion. Sarah, tell me this, um, why aren't the British people um, standing up and, uh, and, and fighting against this? Why, why, why are, is, is the country that, that stood down Adolf Hitler, what, what has happened to these people? Yeah, um, England unfortunately is a post-Christian country. So most people there will think, I know all about Christianity, I know all about your God, you caused the Crusades, you caused slavery, you've done all the wicked things in the world, we don't want your Christianity. And, and in that, and in, um, in trying to convince themselves of that, they kind of elevate Islam. And they say, look, these are minorities, you need to treat them better. Doesn't your Jesus tell you about these things? That you need to treat minorities, you need to welcome them, you need to, you know, what makes you think that your religion should have preference over Islam? So there's this post-Christian anger against Christianity um, mentality, also the need to be multicultural, the need to be extreme liberal and just take on every idea as it's um, in a way that it's equally important. Um, there's also the secular agenda. Um, so there's many reasons why they just can't see. And I think there's this willful blindness. I have never experienced so many times when people are defending the Quran and you ask, well, have you actually read it? And they're like, no. And they're attacking Christianity, well, have you read the Bible? No. It's this willful blindness, like they don't want to know <laughs> um, what it says. They, they just have a, a notion and they're gonna defend it for, for all it's worth. Um, this is just sad, um, to, um, I think, is it Donald Trump who's coined um, post-truth, <laughs> the post-truth phenomenon all, all around that time? And I think Christian, uh, the, the situation in Britain is people are post-truth and they're not even looking for the truth. They're not interested in the truth. They have their narrative, that's it, they're going to stick with it. And, and, and part of that narrative, pardon me Beth, part of that narrative is uh, David Garrison's book, The House, Wind in the House of Islam. Tell, us, tell, tell people a little bit about that book and then the truth. Can I just add one more thing to Absolutely. what Sarah said? The other reason why people are ignoring the reality is fear. Fear in the church and fear um, also just in society. Um, and there's real reason for it. I just want to read you a verse from the Quran. This is taken from Surah 5, um, chapter 5, or book 5, verse 33. And in book 5, verse 33, um, and many verses very similar to it, it talks about those who commit mischief against Islam or those who are enemies of Islam. Sarah and I are enemies of Islam. We're not enemies of Muslims. I want to make that very clear distinction. We love Muslims. We love the people. That's why we critique it. And that's why we want to get 2.5 billion Christians in the world. We're still just the largest religion in the world above Islam. We want to have 2.5 billion Christians in the world confidently challenge Islam and in a sense become an enemy of Islam, but those who love Muslims. But I want to read why this fear. Surah 5.33 says this, the recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger, that would be us, who do mischief in the land, and that's an important little phrase there. I had quite a few Muslim missionaries say to me, Betty, you're doing mischief. When you do mischief, it makes, means that you are a legitimate target for a Muslim to take out. It's a, a veiled sort of threat. So we get this kind of veiled sort of threat quite often. So those who do mischief in the land is only that they shall be killed or crucified with their hands and their feet cut off from opposite sides or be exiled from the land. That is their disgrace in this world and a great torment in theirs in the hereafter. So it instills fear in the hearts of those and the minds of those who want to engage it. And there's a lot of fear to engage Islam. That is another reason why people are blind to the reality. And that feeds into the question that um, Larry just asked about a book called the, the Wind in the House of Islam or Wind in the House of Islam. How many of you have read that book or have heard of this book? 
Well, it's a very popular book in Britain, and those who believe in coming alongside Islam, in making friendship with Muslims, who believe in the strange concept um, of, let me rephrase that, I believe in friendship with Muslims, but who um, believe in the strange concept of friendship evangelism, which is a strange idea, um, when they believe that and they want to find common ground with Islam, this book is loved because what it talks about are miraculous movements of God among many Muslims around the world. And there's a lot of um, ideas floating around the Christian world that um, God is bringing many Muslims through dreams and visions, millions of them, millions in Indonesia, millions in North Africa, millions in Asia. And as a result, a lot of Christians think, well, God's doing the job. We don't need to do the job anymore. We don't need to engage Islam. In fact, it's just a Holy Spirit movement. So why are you debating Muslims every week of your life? You need to just depend on the Holy Spirit. They don't misunderstand that God told us to go out and make disciples of all nations to demolish strongholds that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, and to defend our faith in the context of fear, 2, uh, 1 Peter 3 uh, verse uh, 14 and 15, I think it's 1 Peter. I always think it's 1 Peter or 2 Peter, I always get that wrong, <laughs> 1 Peter. And we are supposed to defend confidently and we're supposed to demolish arguments. And of course, that's the Holy Spirit uses that. He speaks through that. But in the West, there's this idea that we sit back and we let just the Holy Spirit of God um, intervene and use visions and dreams. Now, God is using visions and dreams. Many Muslims have a vision or a dream of Jesus at some point in their journey to Christ. But usually they still have to meet a Christian or still have to hear a Christian message or get part, a part of the Bible into their hands and into their minds in order to come through. And actually, I say one of the reasons maybe God is having to use dreams and visions because we're not doing our job properly. We're not where we need to be. We're not willing to die for our faith. We're not willing to be persecuted for our faith. The church is a timid church, especially in Britain. And so this book is being um, sold all across Britain. It's very popular here in America. And we know, we can't um, publicly say exactly how we know this, but we do know, we have the evidence, that some of the statistics in this book are not true. One of the reasons we have a guy on our team who comes from one of the countries that this book talks about. And when he read about the statistics of hundreds and thousands coming to Christ in his country, he said, I live in that country. This is just not true. And so we know this over and over again. One of the difficulties with this book is that it cannot be checked by any one of us. We are not allowed to meet these hundreds and thousands of apparently Christians or at least Muslims on the journey to Christ inside many of these countries. So we can never tell whether it's right or whether it's wrong. So be, be careful of statistics. Islam it holds a quarter of the world's population in its grip. Now that is a genuine statistic. <laughs> Islam holds a quarter of the world's population in its grip. And by the end of the century, if the church doesn't stand up and confidently engage, it will surpass us in number. Um, it, Sarah, can I have you say something about that? We were talking about that earlier. How are the, all these converts made? Are, is there like an Islamic veggie tales um, that's used? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. There's just a, another problem in the book that I'd like to, to highlight. And what he does with these movements and the way he defines these movements is he says in one to two decades, he wants to see um, a people group who have had over a thousand baptisms or set up a hundred churches. That's his definition of a church planting movement. And, and number one, um, where do you get that? He himself admits it's arbitrary. So are you saying that it's not, you know, a, a movement can't be, a, you know, um, a 90, 99 church plants? It can't be this. And, and it's, well, if you look at the story of Jonah, if you look at the story of Jonah, is the focus on those who accepted Christ after Jonah obeyed or is the focus on Jonah? The focus seems to be on Jonah. And thankfully, he goes and he does what he needs to do. The Ninevites convert um, and, you know, they repent and, you know, the, the city is saved. But it seems that later in the Bible, they lapse back and the city is destroyed. Now, according to this book, the, the movement would have been celebrated. 
and Jonah would have been forgo- and Jonah would have been forgotten. So there's an issue with regard to categories, and as Beth has said, there's an issue with regard to, in fact, where are these people? What's the evidence? We don't see them um, in the Gambia, um, where I've just come back from. There was a small Christian church. Um, it's the second on that plot. The first church was burnt down by the Muslim neighbours. And um, there was a five-year battle to get the land back. They finally got the land back. Um, they had to deal with lots and lots of battles. People would come and smash windows and, and um, try and burn things again and, and, and you know, steal from them. And they had to you know, keep <laughs> trying. The, 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 way, the police system doesn't work very well there. So you know, they're, they're defending themselves and you know, trying not to be violent. And when there was somebody who would come to Christ, the whole family would come and, and um, just um, punch and kick them in front of everyone saying, come home. And the church leaders will say, OK, you need to go home because we don't want to be accused of kidnapping you and all kinds of complications all kinds of complications and they need to disciple these people for many many years and they're seeing growth it's one at a time but that's not described as a movement in this book that's not seen as a wind or the God's wind moving through that book even though they're doing immense work under immense persecution so that's my criticism of the book and that work will last for a long, long time. They will have eternal, people who um, forever will be committed to Christ. But the movements in this book, it will last 10 years, 20 years, and that's the end. God is concerned on seeing fruit develop, not how many people, how many baptisms, how many churches. So that's that's my little criticism. Um, In regards to how people are, how people are, say, um, converted into Islam, again, um, when I went to the Gambia, it's one of those places, you, have you heard of the series of roots? Yeah. Roots. Roots. So um, the Gambia, there's an island off the Gambia where Kunta Kinte, the star of roots, was meant to be taken from. And so there was a guide showing us around all of those places and we were talking to him and um, finding out about the transatlantic slave trade. And I said to him, um, well, you know, do you, what about the trans-Saharan slave trade? Do you... Do you talk about that here? Is there an awareness of that? And he said, uh, yes. And he began to tell me that his ancestors, and the, they're called the Giryos, they're like the people who would play um, on this kind of, it looks like a guitar, but they would memorize history and, and share it with the community. And he'd say, yes, we, we know about it. We know that um, Muslims came and they forced our ancestors into Islam. And I'm saying, well, why isn't there so much of, of an outrage against this slavery as opposed to the transatlantic? Both of them are terrible. But the trans-Saharan lasted for 1,300 years. And we know in some places there are still slaves, like in Mauritania, in Mali, even where I was. We were aware of an Arab who had brought his two slaves from Mauritania, and they were working down the road. Why is there not an outrage with regard to that? And um, he didn't really say much. And even when I went to the university speaking to the students, they were aware of it. And so um, there is awareness in some people that Islam came by force. It didn't get all the way to the west coast of Africa um, by giving out tracts and inviting people to Islam. There was a method of force. Um, you either convert or you're, you're killed or you're taken as a slave. And if you're a man, it's not good because you're going to be castrated. You're going to be trekked ca- across the desert where many of them don't even survive. And you're not going to have any progeny. This is why we don't see as much black people in Ar- Arabia or in Turkey or in India just killed off, women taken as sex slaves. An interesting comparison is that there were more if you look at the transatlantic slave trade there was more men taken to the americas and to the caribbean to do labor with the trans-saharan it was more women they needed them for the sex slaves and we still see the ongoing consequences of this in cases like rotherham where the police the council the government all conspired not to um, not to expose the issues of islam so um, we still see this conversion and so even in whether we see converts the the battle they have to free themselves from their family, to free themselves from Islam, the the physical fights, the spiritual fights, it's the economic fights. You're not going to have any inheritance. You're not going to come to any family gatherings. Today you are no longer my son. This is what they have to do. So you can see why people, once they're in it, it's very, very hard to get out, very easy to get into it. But once you're in, very difficult to get out. Very well-known cleric said, 
because of the apostasy law in Islamic law, which means in all five schools of law, the four main Sunni and the Shia, if you leave Islam, you are ultimately put to death. You're sometimes given a few days to repent or you're put to death. And a very well-known cleric said that it, because of those apostasy law, or no, he said, if we didn't have the apostasy laws, Islam would no longer exist. Very interesting. Um, as we close um, this evening, ladies, um, Beth, could you walk us through the little handout that you have there on comparing the man, Muhammad, with, um, with our Lord Jesus Christ? So if anyone ever makes a claim about Islam or Christianity, the quick response you can say is, what does the man and what does the book say? What does the man of, of Christianity say? What does the book of Christianity say? What does the man of Islam say? What does the book of Islam say? So and of course, of course we affirm that Jesus is God as well, but it just helps when we explain that. The book and the man. So um, I've given you a comparison that we use a lot. We use this with Muslims a lot to show why we don't accept Muhammad as a prophet and also why we, Jesus absolutely is God who come um, to walk and talk with us. Who is the model for today? So this comparison and just gives you a real helpful little deep understanding and insights into um, the core model of our both our religions, Islam and Christianity. Start with Jesus. He was born supernaturally. He was born of a virgin. Nobody else in this room was born of a virgin. Something very unique, something very special about this man. Even the Quran says Jesus was born of a virgin. Muhammad was born just like you and I. There's nothing special about this man. Then you have um, Jesus from a very young age. He was biblically literate and he was spiritually mature to the point where the religious leaders in the temple when he was 12 years old were shocked by how much he knew. Muhammad came from a pagan family. He was a pagan and he, according to most Islamic traditions, was illiterate. He couldn't read or write. Jesus, when he came into his ministry, he was a man who had nowhere to lay his head. He was poverty stricken. In fact, there was women who traveled with them and out of their means supported them and, and helped them with, with food and so on. And he had nowhere to lay his head. When Muhammad came to power, he, when he marauded into villages and took control over them, he took 20% of the wealth and the loot for himself. When Jesus came into his ministry, he performed miracle after miracle after miracle that showed he had power over life and death um, and health and the weather even. Muhammad did no such miracle. He was not a man of miracles. When Jesus um, came into his ministry, he healed the blind. He raised the dead. He healed um, withered hands. When Muhammad came into power, he branded his enemy's eyes and blinded them. He took the, lay, the walking and he made them lame, the opposite of what Jesus did. And in, under Islamic law, Muhammad did this. He cut someone's hand off for simply stealing an egg. And that is right through Islamic law. When Jesus was in his ministry, he, uh, when the immoral woman or the woman of the night wept on him and asked for forgiveness, he reinstated her and transformed her and forgave her, something that Muhammad did the opposite of. He stoned the immoral woman. A verse in the Quran that has been taken out is called the verse of Rajam, the verse of stoning. It no longer exists in the Quran because according to Islamic tradition, it was apparently eaten by a goat. And so it's not there anymore. It's been replaced um, with whipping the adulterer, which is still in Islamic law. Jesus raised the dead. Muhammad um, killed the living over and over and over again, including a woman, a mother, who, whose uncle had been killed by Muhammad and she was feeding her baby one day and Muhammad said, who will get this rid of this woman for me? One of the, Muhammad's um, followers went and put a sword through her chest as she um, fed her baby and she died with her children around her and Muhammad affirmed him for what he had done. That's the kind of man Muhammad was. So Jesus raised the dead, Muhammad killed the living. Jesus freed and forgave um, those um, who were against him. Muhammad killed his enemies and condemned those who were against him. Jesus was sinless and righteous, and that is both according to the Quran and also um, the Bible. The Quran says Jesus was righteous. The Quran says Muhammad had to ask for 
for forgiveness on three separate occasions. Muhammad was not only a sinful man according to the Quran, he is absolutely a sinful man according to the Bible, and he is absolutely a sinful man according to secular law. He was an unrighteous man. Jesus was sinless, Muhammad was sinful. Jesus died for sinners. Muhammad, um, ki um, Muhammad um, killed sinners. Do you see the difference? Pulls apart these two religions. And there's a beautiful story of a radical Muslim man, part of the Muslim Brotherhood in Britain. And he went to Saudi Arabia because he wanted to go to the heart of Islam. He had followed Muhammad um, to, to a T, exactly as he should as a Muslim. And when he got to Saudi Arabia, he, as a doctor, was utterly appalled at the abuse of women and children in that country. He became so disillusioned with Islam, he realized that Islam had not worked in this country that is the heart of the Islamic faith. He was given papers by our colleague, Jay Smith. And these papers challenged the authority of Muhammad. And he first of all got incensed and then saw that everything that these papers said about Muhammad was true. And then he read the verses in the Bible where Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he committed his life to the Lord Jesus then and there. He left radical Islam and became a radical Christian and brought his whole family to faith and began to love his enemies. And this is the clincher. Muhammad is dead. Muhammad can help no one. Muhammad cannot help his Muslim followers. Muhammad can do nothing for you. Jesus is alive. He reigns on high. He can transform our lives. He can transform society. And he is the only answer to radical Islam. And we carry that message and we take it to the world. Fabulous. Thank you so much.